All right, so this is take two <laughs> of my interview with, with uh, Susan Correa. And welcome to uh, the Third Drive stage. Uh, we uh, have been posting this uh, stream interviews for some time now that are focused on basically mining and exploring uh, the minds of world-class um, experts and really what we're looking for is transformative ideas, things that can change our lives, can change our perspective on life, all of that. Uh, today, I have Susan Correa. She's the CEO of Arden Eden with me. And the, the reason I wanted to talk to you because she is the master of integrating profit and purpose, which is a very hard thing to do. Before I uh, um, start talking to Susan, let me, uh, let me show you something, but I'll introduce her first. Uh, since inception, the Art and Eden brand has won industry accolades such as Best New Brand, Most Sustainable Brand, Most Socially Responsible Brand, and has been embraced across America at Nordstrom's, Neiman Marcus, Van Mora, Macy's, and Belk in Canada, and Babies R Us, among other places. They have an online store as well, and they make beautiful, wonderful uh, uh, children's clothing. And there's so much to the brand and to the business and to Susan. Um, but so before we start talking, I want to introduce uh, her with a small clip from the New York Stock Exchange floor. Uh, this is a, a clip from um, a, a platform called Cheddar. And uh, I, if, if you're interested in this clip, watch the whole thing. But I'm going to just show you a few seconds of it because it gives you a, a taste of Art in Eden um, that is fantastic. Do you see the need for systemic changes to encourage other businesses to also go the route of sustainability? Because without a doubt, keeping in mind their profits is largely probably one of the reasons that they avoid it. What needs to change in the overall model to encourage more people to, to follow the route that you have? I think it is a business imperative to embrace sustainability, to care. I have uh, lived my entire journey with profit as the only purpose of business. And I am so grateful that I have this opportunity through Art in Eden to really address systemic change and to really truly understand that changing the world starts with changing me and a better world starts with a better me. And how do I embrace the fact that the sole profit of business is not just profit and profit can have a greater purpose and profit can have a shared value and we can have a stakeholder model of business where the interests of the entire value chain is important and addressed and taken care of. So I think it is a business imperative, not a choice anymore. All right, we'll leave it there. Susan, it's great to have you here on the show. My pleasure completely. Thank you for having me. This is Susan Correa, she's the CEO and founder of Art and Eden here with us on Cheddar. That was fantastic. I really love that interview um, and all the pictures that they show and the dimensions they explore. So if you're interested in this, please uh, find it on, on YouTube. Um, it's, it's really fantastic. So Susan, welcome. Thank you for having me, Christian. Okay, so we had a we had an, a failed attempt earlier on 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 this, and the sound didn't come together. But which is sort of the price you pay for a live streaming. But I still love live streaming because you get to interact with the audience, you get to have questions, people can introduce themselves, where they're coming from, where they're logging in from, uh, and it's just a it's, it's a special experience to me. So I'll take the technical difficulties uh, any day uh, if I can live stream. So here's a question. You say something really fascinating in in one of your interviews. I think it's the the one we just played. Is that you? There's you. There's not a a contradiction in buying better and doing better. All integrated in one in one philosophy. Um, you talk about the a sustainable production chain that throughout the entire um, sort of chain of of producing clothing. Uh, there's many. I mean, I was completely ignorant of some of the downsides of it until you and I spoke a, a few months ago in detail about the story and the journey because I just didn't know about the industry that that much but you started a um, a business after already being running I think a couple of multi-million dollar businesses at the time and so I'm interested in what would uh, what would push you to do something so foolish like to embrace uncertainty starting something that hasn't been fully done before not knowing if it's going to work or not and leaving something that is so stable behind uh what possesses someone uh, to do something like that and the reason i tell you is because there are people out there like myself and many others who are entrepreneurs 
And I think it almost comes with the territory of being wired a certain way. You have an itch, like a dissatisfaction, maybe with the status quo, maybe something else. You can explain it to me. And it prompts us to leave something that is maybe more stable, more safe, more predictable to something that is uncertain and with with a high probability of failure. And we still make the jump. We still take the step of faith. How was that for you? You use the word foolish. foolish. I use the word compelling. <laughs> That's better. I, I think it's uh, really difficult to do something, especially at the stage of career we are in. I was running two multi-million dollar businesses. And if the idea was foolish, then I wouldn't have pursued it. But I think the idea was compelling. Um, compelling enough for me to exit two multi-million dollar businesses as the sole breadwinner of my family and embark on this new way forward for business to align profit and purpose. I would, I would rather try and fail than fail to try. I think, yeah. Well, I, when I met Foolish, obviously I was joking because I was talking about myself. I've done it a few times. And, uh, yeah. and because I'm talking to an audience, sort of encouraging people to think boldly and to find ideas that basically that are compelling exactly exactly what you said um so what is the spark what was the what was the you know in in filmmaking and storytelling we call that the inciting incident there's always something you're thinking about it you're you know itching for it and there's barriers what was the inciting incident it was was it a conversation was it sort of a process a what what changed what made basically said I'm going on this adventure. I, I don't know whether you know the story of the Chinese bamboo tree, but mm -hmm. if you plant it as a little sapling, for four years you see nothing. And in the fifth year you see a sprout, and in six months it becomes 90 feet tall. I think my journey was like that. I was on this pursuit of profit, but all the while surrounded by people that did incredible work with impact but I had neatly compartmentalized my personal and professional life and thought that they were siloed and very different. But I can't say that I was not impacted by the lives I saw of people that I knew very closely that were other-centered, the true authenticity of their joy. So I think somewhere deep down, the seeds were planted to be able to engage in a life of purpose but it was a journey that I thought I would embark on post-retirement. It was August 18th, 2014, uh, when I was uh, on a trip to India, uh, to the Hope Foundation School. I had, Christian, it's echoing a lot, I think. Should I go on? No, no, I can hear you quite well, actually. Okay, great. So um, it was a trip to the Hope Foundation School and uh, I was there to make a difference in the life of those children. I was reading a very powerful book. It was Seth Godin's Lynchpin. The book spoke about a whole new way to do business. It spoke about the journey of an artist and a journey of art. And I think it was the catalyst that took my past experiences, that took the experience at Hope Foundation and just created something that was so beautiful, which is Art in Eden. You know, I, I love that you mentioned Seth Godin because he's the man. and. Uh... You know, I I read Lynchpin. I've reread Lynchpin several times. It's 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 definitely one of those influential books for me. Yes. Um, so tell tell me about. I think you told me in a little bit more detail this this Hope Foundation trigger. What happened there? More specifically. I think for the first time in my life, there was a difference in the way I experienced impact. You know, you give your checks, you tithe, you do you do the regular stuff but I had never touched impact at such a close level. I went in really fired up to make a difference to the life of those kids. I came home that evening completely transformed. The kids had changed my life. I think for the first time I experienced it at such a, you know, to hear somebody else's dreams, to see that you could be part in making those dreams a reality, to see how little it really took to make somebody else's dream a reality and how uh, so overjoyed those kids were by virtue of having the experience to have had us there and sponsored the meals. It was, it was like an experience I've never felt before. 
Uh, for the first time, I recognized the power of business to make a difference in the life of um, children across the world. And in some strange way, um, I recognized the fact that I was that kid one, once upon a time, you know, way back, way back when my own journey had begun. So there was a confluence of many different, very strong um, events and experiences that triggered, triggered a whole desire to embark on this new way forward for business. So you and I share sort of a very strange uh, similarity. You've shared with me, and I, th I thought, wow, this is, uh, this is very rare that I talk to someone who struggles with similar things. And what you've shared to me is that you, as a, as a, as a faithful Christian, as a devoted Christian, you, for, for the longest time, had, um, in your mind, it was like commerce and, and Christianity don't go together. It seems to, and I had very similar feelings, and it wasn't really about Christianity. It was uh, per se for me. It was slightly different in the sense that I, I very subconsciously, although I was an entrepreneur, felt that commerce it was almost like a non, a secondary, non-central part of life, and maybe an inferior part of life that I should be slightly ashamed of or something like that. And, and I really struggled because obviously I was, you know, I started several companies. I had this entrepreneurial way of thinking and it was almost in my bones. And it's, it, it, at, some, at some level, I think I was ashamed of it until I heard, um, I read actually a couple of books by Daniel Lappin, who's a rabbi, and he basically brought this whole um, cultural dimension of of biblical Jewish uh, sort of culture that talked about commerce in a way that I've never heard before, and you had some sort of I think shift that that is similar, and but you had the same struggle. Can you tell me a little bit about the struggle and how that affected you, and how did you overcome it and change the way you you view things? <laughs> Good question. So. Um... I fundamentally thought that commerce and Christianity were incompatible. Um, business to me was very easy and simple to understand. Its logic was very direct. You had to be first, you had to be fast, you had to be sure, you had to be strong. You led from the top, you played to win, the winner took it all. Um, you know, success was very tangible. You amassed titles, you amassed things. Everything was very frameworked and structured. I loved the path of business, so we we defer on that front. So I never, I never, I never be, I never thought by being engaged in business, it was compromising my my life in any way. But I I had segmented my personal and professional life in two neat little packages, and um, and I, I can explain to you a little bit about the ju the juxtaposition of Christianity and why that felt so contradictory to business. Because I felt like while the logic of business was very easy to understand, the inverse logic of Christianity and Christ's paradoxical thinking, like try telling someone in business, you've got to be last to, to be considered first. You've got to be meek to inherit this earth. You've got to surrender to find strength. You've got to give to receive. Like those principles didn't, didn't align with something that we had fundamentally, uh, you know, come to hold as the tenets of, of uh, commerce and so I thought okay here's how I'm going to do my business and here's how I'm going to do my professional uh, my Christianity but they were they were two separate they were two separate departments of my life but I I don't think there was ever a point where I didn't wonder whether it could align whether I didn't wonder whether there could be a confluence what would be the business of benevolence what would be that place where commerce and Christianity came together because I had far too many wonderful experiences in the faith uh, and examples of other centeredness that just it was just too real to ignore. And I think that that experience at the Hope Foundation School, you know, gave birth like that Chinese bamboo tree. All of a sudden it just it just sprouted to life. So it the seeds were growing. I just couldn't see them it's constantly thinking about it. It's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing how much how inner how much inner conflict we can have, you know, uh, and, and how yes. torturous it can be, right? Um, yes. Yes. How did you how did you reconcile sort of this idea of mon the exchange of money for a service 
as opposed to, let's say, ministry and serving others? I mean, I, I have an answer in my mind. I, I just want to compare notes, you know? So I've um, watched the journey of raising money for the poor from a church perspective. Uh, my brother was a very important part of Hope Worldwide in India. And I saw the many challenges faced in raising funds to do good work. I think what happened at the Hope Foundation School was a realization that there was a non-dependence on another institution to make the difference that we wanted to see in the world. If I generated a profit-driven business, I could do, do well and do good at the same time without depending on anybody else's benevolence. And I think that magic happened in that moment when I realized because I don't need anybody else's help really to do this. We can do this within the framework of our business. I don't have to, you know. So no guilt and just a, a sense of immense strength uh, to see that it was within my, the stretch of my own ability to make change happen. Yeah, it was very similar uh, for me. Um, I think I realized that, you know, if we build businesses and the business is kingdom minded, it's a kingdom business. It is to glorify God and to serve people there's an alignment there that happens, right? And um, you're right. I think generating revenue that can be channeled to to serve the poor, to equip others, um, it, it was just a transformative thing for me. Uh, one of the things that, um, that again, Daniel Lappin in his book, I think it, I didn't mention what the book title was. It was two books, actually. It was Thou Shall Prosper. And there's another book called uh, Business Secrets in, from the Bible, something like that. And he said something profound that for some reason for me, it was there's like a switch to sort of something switched in my mind. And it was, um, if, if somebody give it, gives you money for something you did, they, they value what you gave them more than they value their money. Otherwise they wouldn't give you their money. Right. And it's basically what he says is he's, he says, look, money is, is commerce and money exact specifically is a way that God incentivizes us to serve his other children. And, and it was just profoundly... Uh, I, you're, you're, am I breaking up a little bit in your, in your headset? I I, yeah, you're breaking up. It's okay. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Um, talk, can you tell me about mentors you've had who have influenced the way you think and shaped the way you are right now? I think it's an incredibly important component for every entrepreneur to have really really awesome mentors in your life uh, you have to brace yourself for a very tough journey entrepreneurship was never promised to be easy anything worth living doesn't come easy and uh, it's not a journey you can undertake on your own so um, i have surrounded myself with people that uh, have really called me higher um, on a personal level, my husband's my best friend. He's an avid reader and ha has helped me to grow and develop as a person in learning and growing and just being always there as a sounding board when I needed him. My brother Ian has uh, really uh, exemplified a life of impact and uh, helped me to see that it's in giving that we really receive. Um, or throughout my entire journey in the US, a gentleman and now my partner uh, in the business, Mr. Om Bhatija, um, is a man of just incredible, incredible uh, integrity and character. I've had the really good fortune to walk in his shadow for the last 14 years here in the States. Um, I had a great CFO with one of our investing companies back in India that was my 9 a.m. buddy every morning, which just explained and uh, helped me understand and navigate all the financials of business and fundraising, et cetera, a, a terrain that was new to me. And uh, the really recent past, over the last two years, I, through really divine inter intervention, I got a chance to uh, have a conversation with the um, uh, global president of La Ralph Lauren, who's now retired. And uh, after he heard the Art in Eden story and my desire to make a difference, uh, embarked on this journey with us and uh, helped bring on an entire team that helped us to, you know, um, navigate North America. And um, he also brought on another colleague of his, uh, Matthew Youngs, who's been just like an immense and stoic support to me over the last year. 
So just a ton of really, really good people. I, I can go on forever, but, but these are the people in the recent past that have really stood out and helped nurture this journey. And, you know, you can go fast alone, but if you want to go far, you got to go with people. And it's really important that someone's there to share your joys and, and, um, and be there when you need to, when you're struggling. So it's great to have a core in a circle. I totally agree. And I, and I love that you have this such a range. You have your husband, you have your brother, Ian, who yes. actually I know him as well. He's an amazing guy. And, but also on a professional side, I mean, the fact that you attracted uh, uh, former presidents of Ralph Lauren, like these are big brands who, that, are his, that are iconic. And with your vision, yes. you were able to, to get their attention and even their time, which to me, that's just speaks tons about uh, the value that you bring and the vision that you have as a, as a as a business leader, can I ask you? Can I shift a little bit up f um, and sure. talk a little bit about rec more recent event recent events? Uh, we, everybody knows that COVID nineteen has been uh, has particularly hard had hit particularly hard the retail business, tourist business, but retail business, which is a major part of what you do. Um, and you are, you know, it's one of those things when you're starting a company, it takes years and years and years to build it into something fairly stable. So you're still on in growth mode. How does, how do you, how did you navigate? How did you survive? How did you pivot? How did you bring, keep, kept your joy and your, your vision uh, intact? And, and how did your company fare uh, through the COVID-19 um, um, tests? Um. Very early on in my life, I made a, a commitment to live my life by joy. So I choose joy in every situation. Um, I don't look at I look at a problem or an adversity as an opportunity of equal strength. And I think this perspective, this attitude, has really helped me uh, stay calm and um, res find resourcefulness when resources are missing. So pre just the week of pandemic, every single major retailer sent every single notes of order cancellation, which means we're not touching any more goods, we're not paying any money, everything is just standstill. How do you and how do you even how do you even process people. that when, when your whole most of your business is retail? <laughs> it's just terrible. So again, it's again it's uh, it's choosing joy and knowing that. Post every storm, there is always a rainbow. There always is. And I've had enough experience and I've lived through enough storms to, to know that the rainbow does show up. Um, so I chose calm in, in every situation. Also, again, calling back to the mentorship. I mean, Om and um, George and Matthew were just such amazing and stoic sources of strength to me that uh, I, I knew with a, with a great team and my own team as well, I knew we would be able to tie. I mean, I had the confidence that we would have a better outcome than when we started. So long story short, two months down post pandemic, uh, all orders are taken in, all terms are re uh, are, have come back to normal. Uh, I'm not I'm not stuck with one unit in inventory. And pre pandemic, if you had told me that I could build a digital business with a 24 year old kid out of college who had never touched a website or knew the back end of a website before who had no Photoshop experience, which is critical to our business, who um, I gave a task. I said, I need to figure out how we can scale digitally. And I can tell you in two months, we've had the best two months of our entire journey. Uh, the kid is Seth Mitchell. He's Dave Mitchell's son. I think the power of purpose that, that drives us and what we're doing is so strong that it overcomes lack of skill sets it overcomes a lack of knowledge we just find such resourceful ways to build we've had customers order close to 60 to 70 pieces online in a matter of four weeks they get a box they're reordering ordering i had a customer the other day that first bought size two and then she placed an order for size three four five and six so i call her and i'm like are these are you buying clothes for sisters because we just want to make sure that we are packaging the right boxes for you. She says, no, I love your product so much. I'm buying it for the next four years of my child's life. I was like, oh my goodness. So yes, we've had the best two months 
ever in the business. We've figured out everything that we need to know digitally. We've not spent one dollar on ad spend, and um, and you know we've <laughs> it's 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 been the best two months of learning and growing. We've tapped into skills that we never thought we had. Uh, truly, adversity basically squeezes you enough so that you can find new muscles Absolutely. and new vision. It's unbelievable. I mean. It's, it's it's even hard to process for me, like I, somebody who who does retail, how you were able to quickly adapt, and I, and I really credit your your vision and your faith and your heart, your choice. This is a mindset to choose joy. It's a choice to choose joy, and because any other person who's really invested all of his life, his future in this, would be freaking out and losing it and being paralyzed by fear or uncertainty, but you have been mobilized instead of being paralyzed. That's absolutely remarkable to me. <laughs> I, th I think you, you, cannot, you cannot change circumstances. I couldn't impact how the pandemic hit, but I could choose how I chose to respond to it, and I, and I chose to steer my ship. Wow, that is that is absolutely remarkable. You know, so this actually leads me to my next question because I have I think I think that way and I think other people respond, to, let's say, to me. Re, re, uh, if they're a little bit behind on the journey or way behind on the journey, they hear, let's say, my story of my company or my business or my, you know, sort of endeavors of other kinds. And they go, yeah, well, it's Christian Ray. Of course you can do this. You know, and I think psychologically, it's almost like you you choose to be, you think the other person is better than you, but 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 the other person is not better than you. The world has been changed by people that are not smarter than you. Um, it, it's just a mindset. And I think people look at you and there are entrepreneurs out there who are either thinking about starting a business and starting a, a, a com combining meaning and profit uh, Bill, um, and serving the poor and doing something really remarkable that are perhaps f full of, they just can't, there's no inciting incident for them to go on the adventure, or maybe they're, they're in this messy middle where things are really, really hard, and they hear your story, and they can say, well, this is Susan Correa, of course it is, it's Arden Eden, you know, of course it's a success, not me. What would you say to people who have the fire burning in their hearts, the vision, the desire to do something new, and they just either are paralyzed with uncertainty or they can't even make the first step? What would you say to them? I think entrepreneurship is a journey for the brave. So if, if, you, if you think it's going to be um, smooth sailing, then maybe you're not cut out. Everyone's not cut out to be an entrepreneur. So you shouldn't force fit that journey. Right. Um, you know, some people, some people will flourish nine to five jobs. Some will flourish being a minister in a church. Some people will flourish doing uh, not nonprofit work. So everyone's cut out to be differently. You can't be someone else. I always take the analogy of a flower. It shows up every day. It looks beautiful and it has no idea of it's, that it's competing with someone else. It just shows up to do its best work. So you've got to have a compelling enough reason uh, to be able to take this journey, a journey of an entrepreneurship normally is about seven to 10 years. Uh, you've got to be not just passionate about that idea. You've got to be obsessed about that idea. You're going to be living, breathing, eating, sleeping that idea. That's going to be your, you know, your, your buddy for, for seven to 10 years. And there is no, there's no plan B. So if, if you're not, if that's not for you, then don't do it because everyone can't do it. So I can, it's, it's not a cookie cutter mold, but I think your idea has to be so compelling that it makes you jump out of bed every single morning. I've been doing that for over two decades. So I know, I know that for me, it's, it's, it's been, I've never worked a day in my life. I just respond to a column every single day. Can you tell me, that's, that's fantastic, by the way. I, I, I agree. I mean, if you want to start something new, whether it's a new nonprofit, a new church, or a new business, a new family, um, you are pre-wiring your life for a certain amount of suffering. And the idea is really, is this idea, is, the, is this thing that you want to build valuable enough to go through the pain or not? You know, and, and I think you're right about that. Like, look, not everybody should, should do this, but if you are born to do it if you're if if the idea is compelling enough maybe you can 
surround yourself with people who can serve you during the journey a little bit better because they've been through it. They're a little bit ahead on of you on, in the journey. Yeah. And, and the, the whole mentorship thing is massively important in that, you know, don't do it alone. Right. Um, I forgot to ask you this, yep. but you have, uh, and maybe because you didn't mention it, uh, didn't volunteer the information, but I know you, you, you mentioned broadly that there there's good that's being made. Can you tell me about the programs, the nutrition programs, um, uh, the, the ways that you serve the poor and how that it's, already sort of almost like embedded, hardwired into your business model? Um, so a little precursor to that is that in, in, in the journey prior to Art and Eden, I've seen um, corporate social responsibility, I've seen triple, top, triple bottom line accountability. And those pieces were, or the, that, that journey and impact was always, always felt like an afterthought. It almost felt like the business existed and, and, you know, oh yeah, it's good to give back. So let's put in a CR, CSR team and do something on the side here. But it never felt integral to the business model. And again, like when I started out on this journey, even at the Hope Foundation School in India, my idea was not to come back and start a new business. My idea was how do I take this very beautiful idea and build it into the two businesses that I'm already running. But I found it really, really difficult to integrate impact into a journey that I'd already started and was going in a different route. It meant rerouting the business. So after two years of trying, I actually had to dissolve myself, exit the two uh, multi-billion dollar businesses to really bake impact and doing good as part of our, as part of our, of our DNA. So Art and Eden is a public benefit corporation with basically is registered as one of our charter missions to do good all through. So when when we say buy better and do better, we start with the product. So the whole product is organic. It's made in factories that are rated and approved. The dyeing is of low impact dyes. All of the packaging is recyclable. We then uh, work with Hope Worldwide and uh, we committed at the, even before the business started to a million multivitamins and 7,000 doses of albendazole, which, which, we, which we came through in the first year of our business. And we continue to support and continue to find ways to work with them. Uh, we also do a mentorship program because I personally know how important mentorship is and how it's impacted my life. We, as a team, have worked um, with the Camden Street School in Newark in New Jersey. And we mentor kids and give them great experiences in New York City. So really trying to weave that story to be holistic and baked into the DNA of the business so it becomes part of what we do naturally, not of what we think of after we finish work or, or somewhere at the end of end of line initiative. That's fairly thorough and multidimensional. I, I, that's just very inspiring. And, and to me, honestly, I think there's a supernatural component um, when someone has that kind of heart and that kind of sacrificial, generous plan as a things just, you know, come together. <laughs> it's, that's all I can say. It, it's just really remarkable. Um, before I let you go, I, you know, both, uh, both, both you and I read a lot. So if there was a book, like, is, is there a book that you just give people and say, you have to read this or a book that you recommend to everybody or just entrepreneurs specifically, something that's on your heart that you go, okay, this was life-changing and transformative for me. Um, you know, there's been a different book at a different point in my journey, but if I have to pick a book for entrepreneurs, it would be Purple Cow by Seth Godin. I think it goes hand in hand, Lynchpin. Purple Cow is about the product and Lynchpin is about the process. So it's like two sides of one coin um, that, that really helped. It helped me rethink after doing business in one way all of my life. It just helped me rethink of a different way forward for product and process. Yeah, bo both of those books have been transformative for me as well. Um, one that I've been uh, actually rereading recently is is called the, S the Messy Middle by Scott Belsky, and uh, it's basically Scott Belsky is now a vice president of Adobe pr for product, and he he actually bootstrapped a company called uh, Behance that I've been you know following for a long time, that basically created a a, a shared creative space for creatives to show their work. 
Um, and it's wonderful. It has design and, and graphic design and video and animation, and all those things all in one place. And he literally started it, bootstrapped the whole thing for five or six years in a th and sold it you know, sold it to Adobe, eventually became VP of Adobe for product development wow. for uh, obnoxious amounts of money. So, uh, but he has that, mm. he still has that heart and compassion for the entrepreneur. In the book, The Messy Middle, he just walks you through the hard parts, not the glorious parts, the mundane, the daily, the challenges uh, of what you and I, you know, talked about just now as well. And it's just really equipping for, for those people who want to build something. Um, so you are still on the journey, sure. obviously, and, uh, I'm going to actually, by the way, include some, uh, those links to those books in, in the message notes after we, after we hang up. Um, and, um, I want to just say thank you. And I know you're also, uh, still raising money. You're in growth mode. So if, if you're an investor, check it out, uh, check out the notes and get in touch with Susan. If you are a, if you have kids and you want to see some amazing, gorgeous, beautiful uh, 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 pieces of clothing that are both good, they're good in more than design and quality. They're good because of the, of the holistic approach and, and the investment that is being done in the lives of people and how, how caring the whole, the whole line of production is for everybody who's involved from zero to to you receiving the product. Um, uh, please check it out, uh, go online. I'll leave all of the links on, in the message notes, even how you can follow Susan. But once again, thank you, Susan. You are a hero for me. I admire you greatly. You. And uh, you are one of those rare people who can who can beautifully and passionately combine purpose and, and profit and, um, and do a lot of good uh, while you're at it. So thank you for joining the me. The feeling is mutual. Um, you've been an amazing inspiration as well, Christian. So thank you for having me. It's been an honor to speak with you. Thank you all. Thank you again. And uh, please follow Susan uh, in her journey.